Okay. Good morning. Diane, could I ask you to turn off the, the light? Thank you so much. Let, let, no, let, leave the door open because Jerry has to come in. So, okay. So, good morning. And so glad to see so many Rembrandt lovers. <laughs> Who cannot, who cannot not like Rembrandt? It's a, um, such an incredible artist. So today we're going to look at Rembrandt uh, from the time of really, you would say the beginning of his great success. Uh, just to summarize, Rembrandt uh, was born in uh, Leiden in uh, 1606. Uh, did, some training in Leiden, but then came to Amsterdam and worked with Peter Lassman for about six months, went back to Leiden, and in the early 30s decided to move to Amsterdam, where, of course, he had access to many more patrons. He was also at that time under the protection of Constantine Huygens, who was the secretary to the Stadthouder, the, uh, if you want, the governor, the head of the Netherlands at the time, uh, that um, really off, was uh, the source of a lot of commission that he got early on. Uh, in uh, 1634, he bought himself, he, sorry, he met uh, Saskia, uh, his future wife, and uh, against the will of Saskia's sister because she was an orphan uh, but was quite uh, well well off and uh, her family wasn't too keen in her uh, marrying an artist after all it's never very good and uh, his mother didn't care for the marriage either but finally they convinced them and they got married and they seem to have had a very short marriage but very uh, good one just to remind you, sorry, just where he stands as far as timeline. I put there a few names that are very important. At the time, of course, Michelangelo that has influenced uh, most painters at the time. Caravaggio that really influenced uh, Rembrandt because of his chiaroscuro, his his understanding of that big contrast of light and dark and the spotlight effect. And as we know with um, Rembrandt, it's, it's quite obvious that he's influenced by the words of Caravaggio. Rubens, of course, Rubens was the uh, psychological rival, I would say, for, for Rembrandt. He wanted to be at least as good as Rubens but he's going to aim at a completely different uh, kind of works because of just where they were. Rubens was still under the, in the Southern Netherlands that was ruled by the Spaniards and was a world, I mean, known worldwide um, famous painter at the time. And so was asked to do things that were much more worldly than what Rembrandt was, who was living in a Calvinist country and never quit, never left the country to go anywhere else. So his aim in subject matter is very different. Adam Elsheimer, who was a German painter, but uh, was known, <coughs> lived in uh, a big part of his career in Italy, but was known uh, to Rembrandt and uh, was also influential and then a local artist, Franz Hals, that we have seen before, who lived in Harlem, uh, had started that much more uh, spontaneous type of brushwork that Rembrandt is going to use. Peter Lastman, is, uh, his uh, teacher, was just uh, one year actually younger than Franz Hals, but a few years um, older than uh, Rembrandt, so had quite an influence, especially uh, the composition wise and uh, also intellectually, he really groomed uh, Rembrandt that way. Jan Lievens was also a student of Lassmann and for a while was really the direct competitor to Rembrandt. 
they, they worked together, they were friends. And interestingly enough, early on, Lassmann had a much better reputation than Rembrandt. But once Rembrandt found its niche and, and really exploded art-wise, Rembrandt passed him by and Levens was left behind. And he's actually nowadays little known compared to Rembrandt, but a very good artist too. At the bottom, you can see in blue, these are the Spanish, the, Hamburg, the Habsburg uh, that were ruling uh, at that time a good part of Europe. And then in yellow, these are the, the uh, Stadthouders, which were the, the head of the Netherlands. And so William Nassau that was assassinated and then Maurice uh, that uh, succeeded him and then Frederick Hendrik and twice you have uh, the Williams. So Rembrandt, if we pick up in 1631, moved to Amsterdam, married Saskia in 34. In 39, bought a beauty, beautiful house on what was at that time St. Anthony's Breesthaard, which became uh, later known as Joden Breesthaard, which means the uh, street of the Jewish people. And in 42, painted the Night Watch. Unfortunately, in two years time, he lost his mother, three of his four children, his wife and his sister. So we will see an incredible shift Whereas before that, he has a lot of bravado and he's, you know, he wants to be seen as the best and so on. You can see that he has a lot of, of uh, wit, if you want. And you, we will see how the mood is going to change in his work because he's had such a terrible time. Uh, in 56, because of, no, sorry, first in 49, he hired Hendrik, who became his housekeeper and more than that. Um, but uh, he had a very long affair with her, and but uh, they were very close too. And she took care of the last child that uh, Rembrandt had, Titus, who lived with him. So he needed somebody to take care of him. In '56, because he couldn't count, he he loved to spend money, but was not a good administrator. He had to declare bankruptcy. And ahead of time, feeling that it was coming, the Hendrik um, and Titus decided to start uh, a business that was kind of a uh, dealership. So that uh, once the bankruptcy was filed, Rembrandt could work for them. And they were providing at the same time uh, canvases and uh, pigments and brushes, all the material he needed to do. And then he was selling the paintings to them and they were then uh, either fulfilling a commission or they were trying to sell the works. Uh, in 1661, he painted Claudius Civilis. We'll see that's uh, one of the fiasco, extraordinary painting, but that was not seen uh, properly and we'll see why. Unfortunately, Hendrik died already in 63. Uh, and uh, in 68, Titus got married and seven months later died, uh, leaving a little girl uh, that was Tizia. So his name in feminine. Uh, and then in, and by the way, uh, Hendrik also uh, had a child, a little girl, Cornelia. So uh, in 1669, shortly after Titus, on October 4th, the Rembrandt died in Amsterdam and was buried in a common grave. He had no money. And so we don't even know where his remains are. Here's the house that you see in the middle that belongs to, belong to Rembrandt and is now the Rembrandt Museum in Amsterdam. Uh, next to it, it's, this one has been rebuilt in the 19th century, but used to be the dealer, the Van Eulenburg uh, dealer uh, that he had um, befriended when moving uh, to Amsterdam and who was a cousin of Saskia. And that's through him that he met Saskia. So the houses were next to one another. 
In 39, Rembrandt had made a drawing after seeing the painting of uh, Baldassare e Castiglione uh, in, um, and in uh, Amsterdam where it was uh, sold through an auction. And uh, that painting by Raphael really struck him. And you can see how that rapid little sketch he did on the left um, remained with him. And then shortly, I mean, a few years later, actually, no, the same year, he made an etching of uh, Rembrandt leaning on a stone still, so that is um, totally reminiscent of what he had uh, before. But he had also seen by that time a painting by Titian, the portrait of a man, uh, we're not sure who it represents, but where you have more than the, the Castiglione, the, the idea of putting the distance between the, the person represented through that windowsill that is kind of a that barrier between the two. Uh, as you can see on uh, that painting of uh, that self-portrait of Rembrandt, he's already a much more serious person, though he hasn't yet lost everybody, but he's starting to lose people at that time. And so inspired by uh, the two paintings and his own etching, in 41, he's going to make this self-portrait of his. Uh, and this is really the beginning of his great style. He's starting to use a much softer chiaroscuro that, that contrast between the dark and the light is a, a much softer one, a much more gradual. Um, he was at that time uh, doing some open air studies. And so you can see that these atmospheric qualities are rever reverberating. Uh, on his works. As you can see, the mood is a, a much more solemn mood uh, there. But the portrait now, he's got, he's mastered the space. And this is what is wonderful, despite the fact it's a solid background. The, the space is uh, much more tangible than it was before. He's dressed not as the way people were dressed at the time. These are theater costumes. He loved that, that's what in part caused his bankruptcy. He loved to go to auctions and buy all these beautiful costumes that were props for him. And of course, then he gets that incredible commission, the one for the uh, Night Watch, which is a misnomer because for many years, many decades, I would say, uh, the painting was known to be rather dark and so they thought it was the night watch, but in fact, uh, it was caused by a darkening varnish. Uh, in that time, uh, the painters were using a kind of a resin as far as varnish. And this within 10 years, that resin would have darkened enough that it would look like a night scene. When in fact, it's just a, a representation we'll see in a minute of a group that is in the shadow of a gate where the first two and the most important figures are shown stepping out of the shadow. So the actual name of the painting, and follow me because that's the way it was named, the Militia Com uh, Company of Captain Franz Banningcock and Lieutenant Willem van Reutenburg. Uh, these were two uh, famous uh, figures in uh, Amsterdam, Captain Banningcock was actually uh, multiple times mayor of Amsterdam, uh, was, had married very well, was, uh, had a domain in, in the chateau north of Amsterdam and uh, uh, beside the very beautiful house that he had inherited uh, from his uh, parents-in-law along the single um, canal. It's a huge thing. It's a, it's a very large, it's a very large uh, house. Uh, it's about the double of the regular houses that are along these canals. So this was stating right away uh, who he was. Um, yes. 
Yeah, we'll come to it. We'll come to it in a minute, if you don't mind. We're, we're going to talk a lot about uh, this. So once they cleaned the painting, suddenly they discovered a whole series of things, uh, including the little girl here, who is not a real figure. It's an allegory. It's actually the mascot. She is there set so that she wears all the emblems and the attributes of the cloveniers whose uh, militia it was. And so if you, we will see an enlargement of her in a minute. This was considered as a doolan. A doolan was a group portrait uh, typically of militia. And this is almost unique to the Netherlands, to the, the Rep Republic of the Netherlands. They didn't have an army as such. They had militias in each cities. And these militias, as Amsterdam was larger than the others, they had many militias that were in charge of different sections of the city and different roles. These were in charge of um, guarding the gates. And so that was very important. You couldn't get into the city without getting through the gate. Now, this is also what is interesting is, is, is a memory, and I'm sorry, I haven't muted the participants. I have to do that, otherwise we're gonna hear. There we are. So uh, this in fact is commemorating an event that had happened in um, Amsterdam at the time. In fact, that painting has a very interesting history. It was larger than what you see now. Among the century, it had been cut to accommodate the new location. It was first in the guild's uh, hallway, we'll see, uh, hall, sorry, banquet hall, uh, we'll see that. But once it had to be relocated, it was so large that they needed to cut it down. And so you can see on this uh, painting, which is here, the, the, that's the painting, and then they project on the side what has been cut down and it has been cut down on the top too, as you can see here. And we know that because a copy, a very faithful copy of the Night Watch was done in uh, the, let's say, 100 years that followed the, the painting uh, by Gerrit Lundens who copied it. And so we see that that part here is missing and the very top of the arch. That was also done in the 17th century. It happened when it was removed from the Clovis Duren, so the, the, the locale of the, that uh, militia, uh, to the Amsterdam town hall. Uh, so it was cut on uh, all four sides. And then it was moved to what was called at the time the Trippenhuis, which is the first uh, Heikes Museum. That was the Tippenhuis became the Hague's Museum. And you I'm can sorry. see. Are you showing a different slide now, Anne? I'm, I'm so sorry. Yes, thank you. It, it wasn't moving on. So this is seen, this and here you can see better thank you. how it was cut and it's missing the left part. And then a painting representing the new location in the Tippenhuis um, in 1885. And shows you how small it is because that painting, as you know, for those of you that have been to the Hague's Museum, is a rather large uh, painting. The painting is showing it. Why? What really makes its interest is that it's showing different. It's actually thirty-four people that are shown that are all doing something different. And this is done in a very organized manner by Rembrandt. Uh, it shows different weapons that were used by that militia. And it shows sometimes, uh, as you can see here, the, the arquebus, which was the, the given, that gave the name to the militia itself. It was the militia of the arquebus, uh, arquebusers uh, here. He is loading the weapon, 
the little boy who is in front of the little girl is shooting the weapon. You can see the end of the, the weapon there. And then you see this one, the third one is showing how he's blowing off the dust once he has shot, he's done the shot. So it's really interesting because it's a progressive uh, view too. But you have, as you can see here, all the different uh, weapons, you find batons, uh, you find partisan. Partisan was a shorter uh, lens that is worn by this figure, by the Lieutenant at the front. It was called the uh, uh, partisan. The halvards are these, uh, some of these uh, bigger one here. You have it there. And then you have two hand sword, you have sword, pikes, lance, musket, and musket rest, because these were heavy enough that they had to plant the rest in the ground and then put the rifle on and then only shoot because it was too heavy to, to be just uh, carried by hands while they were shooting. Here you can see the arquebus, which is a tinder lock uh, target gun, and is literally the ancestors of the rifles uh, that we know nowadays. As you can see there, it is resting on the arquebus rest to be. You have halberds here, and this is the partisan, the one that is a shorter weapon that uh, is worn. And these had these um, hooks on the side, if you want, that were preventing uh, other swords. They could prevent swords to that were people that were attacking them to prevent the sword to, to harm them. So I talked to you about the commemoration. In at the, yeah, in uh, 1638, Queen Mary de' Medici, that was in exile, had been kicked out of France, literally. Actually, she had run away because she was imprisoned uh, in a chateau and had run away and lived the rest of her life, going from Belgium to Germany to the Netherlands and then back to Germany where she finally died, came to the Netherlands and was received as a queen. She, she still was, the, the name being the mother of Louis XIII. And uh, she came and there was a whole parade and fanfare when she came, including that gate that was built, especially these were the kind of things they would build when uh, other uh, sovereign, some important leaders would come in the city, they would build these gates and then have Literally, they had the, uh, you can see the curtains up there. When they would open the curtain, they were figures, uh, people commemorating a particular event. And here was actually the marriage of Mary de' Medici to Henry IV was represented behind these, these curtains. And so we can see the carriage going by. And in fact, the militia of Captain ba uh, Banning Cock was given the privilege of protecting the queen and to, to be there at the gate. And so the painting that uh, Rembrandt is showing is also a commemoration of that great privilege they had when uh, Queen Mary de' Medici had come. So the painting had been commissioned by the captain and 17 members of what we call the Cloveniers, which was the name of that civic militia guards. And although there are 18 names that appear on the shield, there is a cartouche on the gate that has the name of all the people that appear there that have paid for it. Uh, the drummer was hired and so was allowed to be on the painting, but he didn't pay for it. Uh, so every person that is relevant, 17 of them paid for that and had to have their portrait part of the painting. They had to come to Rembrandt and pause so that he could have their, uh, their face on. Now, the big mystery for a while was that girl that was discovered only after the, the varnish was removed and suddenly she came out so brilliant, so vivid because of the golden color of her dress. And here you can see, and so what happens is that she represents the cloveniers, that that chicken hanging at her belt is actually there for the claws because the cloveniers was a claw. 
And so this was part of the, the attributes of that. She also holds the goblet that is uh, representative of their group. And then the little boy that is in front, who is actually shooting the arquebus, has some oak leaves on the head that are also part of the coat of arms of the Clovenier. It took about a year and a half for Rembrandt to paint the whole painting. He was paid 1,600 guilders, uh, which is, I had made the, the calculation for that, uh, would be quite a, a hefty sum uh, at the time. A uh, hundred guilder was six thousand dollars. So calculate that. So it's uh, sixteen times six thousand. So it, it's um, a pretty good sum for the time. So what makes the the painting very different? Let me remove the little girl. Uh, is that the all the figures that are there in action, they're not just posing for the painting, they're doing things individually. They are looking at their weapons or like the captain here is giving out some orders to the lieutenant. Uh, you have uh, the drummer is drumming. Uh, and here, as you can see, you have everyone is doing something very different. And then in the background, you can guess that big arch of that gate that had been present at the time of the visit of Mary de Medici. They all bear their weapons in a very demonstrative way. Uh, and then you have just in front, you have here the banner uh, that is uh, held by uh, one of the uh, soldiers. So again, as I mentioned, these were not really soldiers, but really called as a, as a militia. The closed gate is of Tuscan order. And of course that was for Mary de' Medici who was from Florence. And so they wanted to celebrate uh, her origin. But Rembrandt wanted to be present too. And so you can just see that little eye Behind there, this is the part of a self-portrait of Rembrandt who wanted to be among the militia present to that incredible work of art. This is the building that used to be the Clovenier's Duel, and so the, the, the house that was built for the Clovenier, for that militia, in which they had a superb um, hall, banquet hall, where they would gather because this was it. They had to, in case of war, guard the, the, the gate. Uh, they were supposed to be present at any parade whenever in Amsterdam, but they had the privilege of at least once a month gather uh, at the Clovenius Duel and, and have a great banquet and drink and have a lot of fun between them. And this is the banquet that was decorated with a whole series of painting. In, we'll see that in a minute. So a very nice um, house that for a while was even considered as the town hall of Amsterdam before they built the town hall, because it was so beautiful. And it is now a hotel. They have demolished the old, but they, on the spot, it's called the Doolen Hotel. So it is in memory of the Clovenius militia. It still is there and you have two men of the militia standing on the facade. The whole way looked this way inside. So it was grand. When you remember the size, the sheer size of this, this is a large hall, uh, hall uh, banquet hall. And it's this, this side where we are, our windows, but all the rest is uh, decorated by different paintings by contemporaries to uh, Rembrandt of the militia in different attire. So the first one was given, interestingly enough, to uh, Joachim von Sandrach, who was a German painter, uh, but is mostly known not so much for his paintings, but known for his uh, history books. He, he is one of the art historian of the time. He uh, followed Karl van Maunder 
But for whatever reason, people question how is it that he was chosen when Amsterdam had many great painters at the time, and he's the first one who gets the painting. He had connection, let's put it that way. He was a, a very smart courtier and uh, made his, you know, had uh, connections and received that first commission. And you can see that the Clovenius uh, militia is surrounding a bust of Mary de Medici down there. So also commemorating that great event of her visit to Amsterdam. On the, above the mantle of the, the fireplace is this painting by Govert Flink. Govert Flink, who was a student of Rembrandt and was uh, a good politician, also was able to get some uh, great commission and we will see later on. Unfortunately, he died unexpectedly uh, young and couldn't pursue his career. But when you see the painting that he does, he doesn't inherit any of the marks of Rembrandt in his style, in his brushwork. He's a much more uh, defined type of, of uh, painter, but excellent painter. What you see there are the four governors of the Clovenius Duden. And it, it just want to draw your attention on that horn that he's holding. These extraordinary vessels were used in particular events as drinking vessel. And so this would be full of either beer or wine and passed around between them to, to drink. And that was used that way, but only rarely. On the right side of the fireplace, another painting by Govert Flink, showing the officers and guardsmen of the uh, Amsterdam Civic Guard company of another uh, captain, Captain Albert Bass. And you can see the talent of Flink. He's obviously a very good painter, uh, has a great way. And there you see an influence of Rembrandt in the way the action that is happening in the painting. They're not just standing and looking at you. There is an interaction between them. They're all very proud, there is no doubt. Of course, you can see in front of you, you see the Rembrandt painting, but then in the very middle, is a painting by Nicolas Eliasson Piquenoy, uh, who was uh, another uh, famous uh, painter at the time in the uh, isocephalic type of uh, presentation where they all have their, their head at the same level. Yes. The question is, why is this so important? It's an amazing amount of artwork done. There. They, they were, most part? of them were important people in the city. So they had, they were known. These were the, the top of the militia. And it, it was one way of socially being, being respected. As I mentioned, this whole banquet hall was considered so beautiful that it was used as a town hall until the town hall was built. So it was very important for them to pay. They each paid for each of these paintings to be part of that. Um, and so it was important for them to show their role and, and their, uh, their deeds. They were the guardians of As I say, there was no, no army. So if any conflict happened, they would have been on the forefront. On the right, painting by Jakob Bakker, uh, uh, who was also uh, from Amsterdam, produced about 140 paintings in 20 years, including uh, portraits, religious subjects, and mythological painting. Uh, he was influenced by Rubens and by Abraham Blumhardt in the, from Utrecht. And then finally, and 
subjective to, to the space that was allocated to it. We have that long painting by uh, Van der Helst that shows the uh, Amsterdam Civic Guard in celebration of the Peace of Münster that was painted in 1648, the Peace of Münster. Uh, confirmed the fact the independence of the Republic officially, the independence of the Republic of the Netherlands from Spain. So it was very important. It was the end of the 80 year war. Now the, the uh, Night Watch, we'll go call it this way, it's much easier, has had a lot of trials and tribulations. On the 13th of January 1911, a jobless Schumacher and former Navy chef slashed the painting with a Schumacher's knife, protesting his inability to find work. So it was restored at that time. Due, due to the imminent war violence, the Night Watch was transferred to a castle uh, close to Amsterdam in 39. And the way they could evacuate it is they had built a slit in the, the, the floor in front of the night watch that they could just open if necessary and then take the whole painting and take it down to the lower level. So down below, they could roll it up and evacuate it. So it was so precious to them. And by the way, that was used for other paintings too, but this is at the foot of the uh, Night Watch. And so during the, uh, the war, it was hidden in some bunkers that were owned by the city of Amsterdam. And uh, then it was uh, transferred in 42, to an art bunker in the St. Petersburg near uh, Maastricht. They have a series of grottos over there, they're literally a network where a lot of the resistance uh, hid, but also where they hid things. And this is the night watch rolled in with the paint outside, by the way, so to have a larger diameter to provoke less cracklures on the, the uh, paint surface. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, crazy people focus on these very known paintings. In 75, the work was attacked by a bread knife by an unemployed school teacher who committed suicide a few years later. And you can see that was badly slashed. Here. And this is what caused the, the cleaning of the, the varnish, because once you want to restore it, you first have to remove the varnish, and then you work on the, the back of the, the canvas to restore it, and then you fill it in with pigments and put another varnish on, and now these are synthetic and don't darken anymore. So the paintings remain much more vivid uh, for a long time. On the 6th of April, 1990, an escaped psychiatric uh, patient sprayed acid onto the painting. And I can tell you one thing, my husband was at the Rijks Museum that day. And uh, so it, he, he was literally, you know, uh, hand checked on the way out by the police. They had to evacuate the museum after this happened. Fortunately, the guards had fabulous reaction. They immediately, through water on it to diminish the, the, the acid to, to go into the painting. So finally, in the 19, uh, the, after this incident, they decide to go for a big job on restoring the painting properly and uh, redoing, you know, having much better techniques now than they had before. Uh, they clean the painting and then they go into all the in paintings that were not well done and then restore that with all the things that they know. And when they do restoration, they do it with a pigment that can be removed. So it's water-based, not oil-based. So that the next generation, if they find a better way of doing it, can uh, remove what is done now and do it better later. So they're really thinking of the future. 
before they did the painting, they uh, did what we call, they submit the painting to what you call infrared reflectography, which is, we'll talk about that next session and we go through the whole technical process. Um, and in doing so, discovered a few of the changes that um, Rembrandt had done when starting the painting because the painting that he used to sketch the painting before painting it were very heavy in chalk. They were able to uh, see the chalk uh, on the painting through the infrared reflectography. And so, for example, if you we will see the painting again uh, soon, look at the number of lenses that they have. They, there's about a third more than he actually painted. So these were the type of things. And they, they are changes in position of faces, but uh, some position of the body, some people he didn't paint at all. So to do that uh, cleaning, they did it in front of people. So they built that little room in glass that was uh, temperature, you know, had the perfect temperature and humidity, um, but was, uh, enable people to look at what they were doing, which I think is fascinating. They've done the same with the um, adoration of the lamb in Ghent. Uh, they also put it in a room with a glass uh, wall so people could see whatever all the, the, the restorers were doing at the time, which I think is wonderful. And in doing so, they discovered different things. For example, you have there's an extra sword than what was known before they did the cleaning. Uh, they had some discolored paint, they missing feathers. Yes, uh, the, this hat was supposed to, to have um, big feathers, but it competed with the two main figures. So he never uh, painted the feathers. It was part of the sketch, but not of the final painting. Uh, grayish hay. So these are different things that they discovered. Yes, Francis. What uh, uh, attracted terrorists or these people to damage this painting? Did it have some kind of political? No, no, because this is every time it's a personal thing. It's people that are out of work or are, are crazy. And you have that attraction. It's, it's the most Attract, you know, attractive painting in, when you come in the, muse, the Rex Museum, it's at the end of the big hallway. It's the, the, the focus is on that painting. And you find that, for example, the, the little girl with the pearl fortunately has a glass in front of it, but has been attacked many times. And it's a tiny painting. It, it happens all the time in, in Paris, they had problems too. Some people focus on certain artwork that is really known to, to uh, as an outlet for their anger. It's, what can you say? Uh, much later, a sculptor decided to look, its name is Alexander Tahatinov, uh, made sculptures of the Night Watch, which are now on the Hemhang plane. You can see the statue of Rembrandt behind him uh, that shows the scene of the uh, Night Watch. And I will send you the, my computer was a little reticent in, in showing it to, uh, to you, but there is a flash mob uh, of the, and I'm sure some of you have seen it, it's wonderful, of the uh, Night Watch in Amsterdam when they reopened the Hex Museum and showed the Night Watch when it was ready to be seen. They made a, they made a big uh, flash mob in uh, one of the, um, commercial centers there and it's fabulous and people are so afraid because they have all these guys in costume running here and there. So I will send you the link to it, you, you will have a ball. So anyway, imagine that uh, he painted this in 42. It was in the middle, it's when Saskia died, when his children had just died, his mother had died, his sister had died. Um, he was fighting with his work. That was his way of holding on. It was really to do that work. But after finishing this, he's going to go through a period where he's not really going to paint, but uh, focus on uh, prints, etchings mostly, and some uh, drawings. But in his private life, he also had some changes. 
1643, he hired a wet nurse uh, for his son Titus, um, who was a childless widow, and name was Gertje Dirks. And uh, as soon as she was in, she became also more than just a wet nurse and they had an affair for, for a while. He actually uh, gave her even some uh, jewelry that belonged to Saskia. A point that I forgot to mention is the fact that when Saskia died, she, had, she died of tuberculosis probably, uh, she had a will that he could keep the dowry. Normally you return the dowry to the, to the parents of the, the person who died, but he could keep it if he was never remarrying. So he couldn't remarry because the dowry was very good and he needed it. So he gave some of the, the jewelry uh, to Gertje who very quickly because she, uh, wanted to live well, went and sold it, and he was really angry. And very quickly, their uh, relationship turned to bitterness, especially when he hired another lovely uh, girl who was also his housekeeper, Hendrik Stoffels. She was, Gertje was very jealous, went to the, uh, the judge, and told him, you know, she had been promised that he would marry her and now he was having an affair with another girl and so on and so on. And there was a consensus between Rembrandt and other people. They literally uh, put her in an asylum. And uh, though she was after many, many years, 12 years, she was, she could get out, but she died penniless and, and uh, it was a very sad affair. Now, Hendrik was adorable and became really the, the muse that uh, Rembrandt needed. Uh, and then once he was in trouble in the 50s, uh, she and Tatus uh, started a dealership that allowed Rembrandt to go on painting. <clears throat> so during that period after the, the Night Watch, he is going to draw and paint. And how would you at that time sketch because he was doing a lot of, he would go around the countryside or the, around the city and sketch things. And this was a way with a tufflet. Uh, the tufflet had some prepared paper inside uh, with gum, uh, gum Arabic. And so he, with the stylet that you see there, he would just draw on it and he would have, uh, he could sketch uh, easily with something that was portable. He didn't have to have an easel or anything like this. And so uh, that was one way for him to sketch and bring back these, then he would turn into uh, a painting, painting or just a drawing or a print. He also became interested in uh, these uh, miniatures, uh, Persian miniatures or Indian miniatures. And you can see how on the right, he's changed slightly the setting. So he takes the, the main portion of the, the miniature uh, and his interest in, in exotic costume is shown there right away for him. He was very interested in that. He was extremely interested in looking at the Jews that were living around him in Amsterdam and their mannerism, the way they were dressed and so on is going to make his paintings very believable if you want because of it. But here you can see he changes the perspective which becomes a much more uh, Renaissance perspective if you want, uh, uh, adds more uh, shadows and so on. So he, the modeling of the, the figures are different but definitely his interest is there. I've shown you this painting already. This uh, painting, sorry, that uh, this drawing of Saskia uh, with a straw hat. That's when he met her just a year before he got married. And this done is done on vellum. So vellum is a parchment, animal skin that was also prepared, they would, they would put some, some uh, particular gum arabic or other things on top, and then he could draw uh, with a silver point that you can see there on the right. And this is a delightful 
uh, little uh, drawing that, it, and the, the writing under that is, this is a portrait of my fiance at the age of 21, three days after our engagement. So very sweet. And you can see how delightful she is. She's obviously a pretty girl. He's going to do many of these drawings and Rembrandt's drawings have very much studied by art students because he has that knowledge of the, of the line that is so incredible, it's such an expressive line and, and uh, just knowing exactly what he needs to do. So he would do it with different um, tools, the pen with ink, and this would be just a regular, one of the large pens of, of geese or, uh, typically, then they would uh, boil to harden it because then when it dries, it, it gets harder and then they could cut it properly to have something that's going to sustain the pressure. Or the reed pen that would also be worked on so that it would be, that, that it would last a good time. And you can see the result of both of them are different. And then he uses, sometimes he uses a little bit of wash. He works a lot with his fingers too. And I would, I would assume that this is the case here, for example, that he would just drag some of the, the ink with the finger. As you know, he did an enormous amount of self-portrait. It's cheap. He doesn't need anybody to sit for it. But also he studied his, his um, grimaces, you know, he was, his expressions. He, he loved to do that. Uh, this is a very young uh, place where in, that's before he left Leiden. And this is done with pen and brush and ink on paper. Uh, the other one, the other one is, is particular for the line. I, I love that uh, two men teaching a child to walk. Look at how few lines to just uh, show these three people there. This is done with red chalk. He was also interested by animals. Uh, he made many, at least three or four of lions and did other animals. The lions at that time, these North African lions were brought on ships of the Dutch East India Company to the Netherlands and then kept in menageries and shown at fairs. And so it's really interesting to see paintings of St. Jerome, for example, that is always shown with the lion before he saw a real lion and once he has seen a real lion, so then he, he knows the other one looks like Dürer that had not seen a lion. And so they are just a hearsay, you know, he looks more or less like this has got a lot of hair and, and but they don't, this is just beautiful. And with wash also, charcoal and wash. He also uh, did studies of birds of paradise and uh, all, all sorts of uh, exotic, um, animals. So we're going to talk about etchings and the, his late works. I'd like to take a, just a little break, if you want, and uh, just uh, ask question if you have any. You can unmute yourself online. And coffee is at the end of the hallway. Thank you. Diane. So I'm wondering, and looking at all these different um, pictures of the civic, uh, the militias and the, the sure. night watches and stuff, um, the the what he he loved these elaborate costumes. But in the in those paintings, they're not really. Are they wearing like fighting clothes? Is that what they would have worn if the militia? No, these are ceremonial clothes. These yeah, are they're not very. They're not very no, sumptuous. You know, not just like no, but just like you have now, the army they have the clothes for being on the terrain and you have the clothes for parades. Uh -huh. That's the same thing. Okay, okay. That's so what if they had to fight, they wouldn't wear lace and, and, and beautiful garments as it's shown there. These are the parade costumes. But I thought in the I thought in those paintings they were not particularly sumptuous. You know, they were they were sort of they seem to be dressed now. But don't forget you're in the Netherlands. You're in the Republic of the Netherlands. You're not in 
what is Belgium now, where you would have, you know, you have a courtly uh, regime and where people would wear these, these, this is a country which is building itself up at that time. Okay, I see. So there's there's sumptuous finery. This is what they're wearing, but it's not as it's not as elaborate as you would see in Spain or Italy. Or... But it would not be what they wear every day. This was really for the show off. Yeah, but it's but it's not it's not super finery like you see in Italy or Spain or something like that because it's the Netherlands. No, it's not too bad if you if you look, you can go back at the the costume the the. Uh, the captain has a lace uh, collar, and if you look at the costume of the lieutenant, it's beautiful. He has uh, special boots, you know, uh, reverse on the boots and so on. So yeah, it's not bad for a militia. They're not, but they're yeah. not all deck, they're not all wearing furs and laces. No, but these are the two rich guys. The others are, you know, from the the bourgeoisie from the middle bourgeoisie. So. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Any question? No, no question. I'm so glad you're going to send the YouTube. Oh yeah, yeah. And I had inserted it, and then it it told me we don't want to to use it because it's not totally secure. And so it's fine. But I'll send it to you. And you know, I have tried and tried and tried, and I have never figured out how to embed a YouTube into a PowerPoint. I you go, I, no, know. okay. There was a difficulty for a while, and that was a dispute between YouTube and Microsoft. So you had to do it for a very difficult way. And then no even that, it out. yeah, and even at that time, it, it was interrupted for a while. Now it's very easy. You go to insert, yeah, and then you have videos, and you you're given the choice. It's a video that is in your uh, in your machine, or is it one on internet? And you click on that, and you have made the copy of the link on yeah. YouTube for the share, and you plug it in, and there it comes. I'm gonna have to go try. Yeah. <laughs> And look at this, it's so beautiful when you see that, that plate. Look at that. Yes. That is what? There aren't any in Belgium of this thing. I don't know. We, there must be some. But they've become, you know, they've become extremely expensive uh, once he was rediscovered. I'm trying to think about what they would be in Belgium. I don't know. Yes. No, a year and a half. A year. Actually, some people say two. No, no, no. It's a year and a half. Uh, some say two years. Yeah. No, and don't forget that you. At that time, they were not painting wet on wet either. Yeah. So they had to wait for some things to dry up before they were gone. So he probably would do a, an engraving or another painting on the side. They always no, but they would work on different works. Okay. Wow. No, 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 no. Okay, don't hurry because we have to start. It. We go on. We but it's amazing when you see that banquet, when you when you see the banquet hall with all these paintings. You imagine the size of that banquet hall. It's incredible. Because when you go to the museum, and the Hex Museum has very high ceiling, it's already taking most of the height. So. Nervous. They're not nervous in that part. Of it. Yeah, it's a big part. Of it. Yeah. 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 So next time we will.
uh, we do Rembrandt's brush, which is going to be a lot of the technical aspect of not only his work, but also how you investigate uh, paintings to see if they are fake or if they are okay, or if they are his or whatever. So it's going to be more technical. So I think the break was necessary. Everybody's gone. <laughs> So did you get some rain this morning? We got a little bit. I, I walked the dog and on the way back it was raining. So fortunately I had a hood. No, but I didn't get anything on the car, but it's between the time I came back. I mean, the, the, the portion of the way back from my walk was under rain and then it was a beautiful rainbow. And it was funny. It was just behind Camelback. When you look, it was really taking its root behind Camelback and then it was disappearing. I said, but okay, where's the other part? And I turned around and there was the other, just the base, not, not uh, even going up. Oh, how beautiful. How cool. You know, I said it's raining, but the sun is rising. It was the rainbow. It was so <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. But, but, but look at what it's all on the other side. Oh my God. The sunrise. That's oh. gorgeous. That's gorgeous. Yeah. I'm always, I'm, uh, right now, oh. I, I hope it's <laughs> light enough. Yeah. And yes, it's yes. about <laughs> 7 o'clock. <laughs> Because in the summer it's before, you know, I typically because the sun she could rise at seven thirty, around seven thirty, but I'm out of it. The half hour before sunrise. And yeah. You want I, I, I used to, but it depends on my knee. I used to walk two a little more than two miles every morning. So unfortunately, I'm slower because of my knee. I can't walk this fast. But uh, I do a little over one mile. You're doing good though. Yeah, as I put sprays on, and then helps. I have a soft brace, but it, it helps. And uh, because there, there are times where I can barely walk at all. So that's, oh. I have to see a doctor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, doctor. <laughs> okay, so we, we if we can turn off the, the light. I don't know what I, okay, she will see hopefully, otherwise we'll have to help her. Okay, so we, we see that after the night watch, um, Rembrandt is going to concentrate on, on prints and he loved etchings. He really loved doing it. Um, it was also a good way to get revenues because you do one work and uh, uh, can you see where you're going? Do you see enough, John, or do yeah. we need some help? Okay. Good. So, um, uh, you know, with the, with the print, 
you have to do the plate, prepare the plate. He would come because he would do many stages uh, to correct, to add some shadows and so on. Uh, but once it was done, he could print many prints and each one he would sell for uh, 10 guilders or whatever. So it was a good source of revenues. What happened to uh, the about 300 etchings that he did in his lifetime uh, is interesting because they are there. I mean, these are plates, it's pretty solid, uh, but they only uh, 82 that have survived. And so we don't know if he reused them or what happened or if they just got lost. But uh, 80, about 82 of them, and they were, as you know, they are prints that date from after he died that are not as valuable as the ones that were done during his lifetime. Um, I have myself one that's really recent and that's not worth anything at all. Uh, in what is interesting is that in uh, the 19th century, there's a French guy, Armand Durand, who did a series of uh, eight different uh, Rembrandts by what you call heliography, heliogravure, uh, where he would uh, expose the, uh, the a paper in front of a of a, on, on top of a print and then expose it to the sun and it had a special uh, chemical on it and it would absorb the rays in a certain way uh, depending on what the, 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 the engraving let the sun through. And so that was uh, another way. Here I have one of these beautiful, let me just go back here so we can see. Uh, so you have the mirror image, which is the engraving that you would uh, see or buy. Uh, always interesting to see the, the copper plate though, because there you can see the etching, as you know, it's easier than engraving because what you do is you cover the um, copper plate with a kind of a, a resin and then with a, a pen, you can go in different tools. You can just make all your uh, drawings. And then what is exposed from that, you, you dip the plate in an acid and what is exposed is going to be eaten. The, the plate is going to be eaten by the acid. And then you rinse it uh, and you, you just put some ink on it and the ink is gonna go within the lines. And this is the result of it. But uh, Rembrandt was known to do up to five stages to correct and accentuate the shadows, for example. One of the most known, yes. Uh, yes, that, that's the way he would do. Or he could do it manually too. He would use um, a silver point, and, and go into the lines and accentuate. And then he would have that, that different uh, edge that is on. So that's why we know that he used the silver point regularly. This is the most uh, valuable of his prints. Um, it, that was, by the way, enhanced by dry point. It is called the 100 guilders, which is the equivalent of $6,000 which was a much, much bigger uh, cost, a much higher price than it would normally get because normally it would be a few guilders uh, per print. But this one was extremely expensive and required, it's a larger one, it's 11 by 15 inches. So it's a, a larger one, but it's uh, quite interesting. It's showing Christ healing the sick. But in fact, uh, where it is uh, inspired by a passage of the 19th chapter of the gospel, uh, according to St. Matthew, he's using different pass part of that passage for each of the groups. So it's like a continuous narrative in a sense in just one image. Here you can see the different um, sentences that are related to. So there are different groups that are part of that. 
And it's an incredible image, the light that radiates from the, the head of Christ, uh, the groups of the, the poor people, you have uh, the sick people, you have the Pharisees there, you even have the faces of Erasmus and Socrates. That are, in, that are included there as people that are next to Christ, which is really an interesting scholastic event, if you want. It's the idea that it's almost like there is whispering in the ear of Jesus. So to the right, you have the sick and the poor that kneel before Jesus. Do um, You have the rich, the rich young man who was advised by Christ to give away all his possession. Uh, he's seen sitting to the left in rich attire. And you have, as I mentioned, the fact you have the Pharisees who are just spying on him to see what, what's is doing is wrong. So the way it has been received by scholars, he said that divine mystery, miracle, sanctification, faith and suffering, but also skepticism, hesitation, Rembrandt evokes all the attitudes of humanity faced with the divine in a supernatural atmosphere imbued with the sacred. And of course, skepticism is Socrates. These are some of the uh, preparation drawing he did. Uh, they are, of course, don't forget, they are mirror image of what it would be. So I'm going to move the one on the top to the position equivalent to the, to the uh, engraving so that you can see that this is the part that is represented here. Again, look at the magic of his use of the line when he does a drawing because it's so suggestive. And this corresponds very much at what we'll see with the way his painting turned around uh, in the late life. But he did, again, lots of self-portraits, the different ones. Um, this is, uh, he did about 80 self-portraits in oil, in chalk, in pen, in ink, and wash, and in etching more than any other painter. Beautiful light with the window just next to him, but a very skeptical expression on his face. And then he started painting again, but very little. This is uh, in 42, so this is contemporary with the uh, Night Watch. He does this painting that is showing either the parting of David and Jonathan or the reconciliation of David and Mephibosheth. Uh, we know that uh, David uh, was very ambitious and Saul very quickly uh, knew that, uh, had the feeling that David wanted his throne. The son of Saul was Jonathan and was a very good friend of uh, David. And, he warned him when Saul was going to come and imprison him or, or kill him. And so enough that David could flee. And so this could be either the parting of David and Jonathan when uh, David is going to leave, or it is after David has taken the throne, uh, Mephibosheth is the grandson of Saul and the son of Jonathan. After his father and grandfather have been killed, uh, uh, David is trying to find this, the heirs of these two to try to give, him, give them back his, their inheritance. And so this is, could be either one. He also does landscapes, but very few. This is uh, one of them, oil on wood. And of course, early on, he had done the Tempest, that painting that was stolen at uh, Isabella Gardner's um, uh, decades ago. And uh, that has never been found, though apparently the FBI knows who did it. So it's an ongoing investigation, but they don't know where the painting is. And 
always the same palette of ochres. It, it's for him, this is his, his bread and butter. It's all these ochre uh, pigments. Some uh, more intimate type of painting, the young woman at the window. Um, this is where we, we can see how a fine psychologist he is in, in describing just the soul of that girl at the window. And we can also see how now his brushwork is shifting from a rather fine painting to uh, a more coarse uh, type of brushwork. He received a commission in 53 from an Italian patron uh, and uh, to, to paint uh, Aristotle uh, that, uh, I'm trying to find it. He was a Sicilian collector, Antonio Ruffo. And uh, he wanted to have that painting to be a pendant with a painting that he was going to uh, commission in, from an Italian painter at the time that got lost, unfortunately. And apparently another painting by Rembrandt that got lost also showing a portrait of Homer. And what we see here is Aristotle with the bust of Homer. And it's an extraordinary, pensive uh, painting where you, you have that feeling that uh, Rembrandt is almost thinking about himself being Aristotle and, and thinking of all the, 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 the pains that he's gone through. And Aristotle is reaching the end of his life and looking at Homer and wondering if he's going to ever be as famous or even being remembered as Homer was at the time. Uh, is this in the brain of Rembrandt too? Am I going to be remembered? Because by that time in 53, he's getting out of favor. His brushwork, it's really interesting, is reminiscent of the late works by Titian. Titian, towards the end of his life, gets a much coarser brushwork, much faster brushwork. And for the collectors, for the intellect, the intellectual in Italy, it was very much appreciated because it was a way for people, the, the people that were knowledgeable to fill in the blanks, if you want. You were looking at this painting from a distance and you would, with your own imagination, filling the blanks of the, the brushwork that were not quite connected. So it was interesting. It was very much appreciated. In the Netherlands, you have two views. You had the people that liked the Rembrandt's work, but by the 50s, the other side is getting more, more favors. The other one are the fan skilters that show you everything in detail. You can come with your nose on the canvas and you're still going to find little things that they have done. Whereas with Rembrandt, more and more you have to step away. And he tells his patrons to step away from the painting to appreciate it. And so what we'll see, it's already visible here with the sleeve, the, the right sleeve of Aristotle, that he's using a lot of pigments. Impasto, the idea that you accumulate paste there. He is, though he is close to bankruptcy, he's never going to be frugal on the, the pigment he's using on his paintings. He's really using a lot. So much so that people were saying when he paints a pearl, it almost has the size of a pearl on the canvas because he puts so much on it. And it, it's a marvelous uh, painting in, in that atmosphere, uh, in the very, um, again, that, that psychology that you have there. The medallion, the chain that he has is the famous chain that I showed you last time for those of you that were there. These were the chains that were given by the powerfuls to, their, to the people that they appreciated. So to an artist or to a, a writer uh, as Aristotle, they would be given. So this would have been given to him by Philip or would have been given, Alexander was too young. So it would be Philip of Macedony who would have offered him the chain and they would wear these to show that they were 
uh, appreciated. Rubens apparently had such a collection uh, that he was exhibiting them in his uh, beautiful uh, hemicycle uh, at his house. But on the paintings, he barely shows just a glimpse of it. He never displays it. Rembrandt, who never received any, always shows them, uh, even on some of his self-portraits. He really displays them uh, a lot. And this is one of these chains, by the way. This painting has an interesting history. It was uh, purchased in 1961 for 2.3 million by the Metropolitan in New York. At that time, it was the highest amount ever paid for any picture at public or private sale. And so this triggered uh, an American artist, Otis K, to criticize the sale. And this is the work that he took from there in putting lots of dollars around to show uh, that he uh, resented the idea of the amount that was paid for that painting. Of course, Bachiba, uh, Rembrandt that makes the most beautiful nude in his career. It's actually the last paint, the last nude painting of his career. And it shows that that terrible story, of course, of Bachiba and David, David that falls in love with her, tries to, to mask the affair that they have because he's invited her to the palace when he's has her husband is fighting away and then she was pregnant. And so the husband wasn't there, it couldn't be him. So they try to, to find a way to bring him uh, very quickly, but the other one is so honest that he says, no, I'm in the middle of a battle, I have to stay over there. So they cannot mask his, uh, his paternity with uh, anything else. So the only way he has is to have him killed so that to get rid of him. But here you have that uh, Bathsheba that reads that letter that David has sent him and she's being ready. The, the servant is washing her to be prepared for, for his arrival. So very interesting. It's considered that the body is not uh, Henrique, but he painted over the face with the, the features of Henrique. Absolutely beautiful. And the, the background, we have that marvelous uh, piece of cloth. Again, this is part of that inventory that Rembrandt had uh, just before his uh, uh, bankruptcy. Very rich uh, dress of hers. He had done uh, previously the toilet of Bachiba, and you can see how he's matured in just the, the way the composition is so much more powerful now. This leads to, of course, a woman bathing in the stream, which is absolutely magic. He's using the same piece of cloth, by the way, that he had in Bachiba. And this is just extraordinary. And you have that feeling that there she's holding her chemise, you know, in her hands and looking at the reflection in the, in the water that she's stepping in. And you almost have to say, what does she see? Is she seeing things we cannot see? There, there is that, that magic of light, that tiny little smile in her face, uh, just, we are getting that very intimate moment of hers. We feel almost like we, we shouldn't be there, but it's extraordinary, the reflection of her legs in the, in the stream. This is Rembrandt at his very best. The woman at an open door that's worked directly on the canvas. So this is not even, there's no sketch under it. So it's, it's a la prima. She was, um, she, she became pregnant and was called in front of the judge to blame her to have an affair, to live with somebody without being married. 
And so they had to pay a, a hefty fine for it. Um, but she remained very faithful to him. I, I love these, the colors that he used, these red, red ochres, and then you have that gold. It, it's, it's just a combination that is so rich to me. His little son, Titus, Titus as his desk. Again, look at how his brushwork is now evolved in a much, it, it looks fast, but apparently it wasn't. He was not painting that fast, but once he decides to put the brush there, it is just uh, very different. And again, you have the windowsill there in between. This is uh, quite an interesting painting showing the carcass of an ox hung up uh, to bleed. As you know, you have to bleed the, the, uh, these carcasses when the, the animal is dead before you can use it. But there's been a lot of interpretation. Is it just a carcass or is it showing Christ crucified or, or others? So there are different interpretation there. And that had been done before. We have Artsen and Berkela in the Netherlands that have shown uh, similar things. And then we have the series of his uh, last uh, painting. This is uh, uh, Jacob blessing the children of Joseph. And of course, picking the child that is not supposed to do. That's uh, very interesting that he chooses the younger one instead of the one that he would be the direct heir. Uh, also there, we know that there have been some changes. He's changed the position of, the, of uh, Joseph next to him. And the, also the position of Joseph behind the children. You can see this is an X-ray that shows you the original uh, position of the, the body. So you can see how he uh, he's changed the position of the face. And so this is, of course, the uh, interpretation that, that Christianity will be greater than Judaism by choosing the one who is going to populate the world. After his um, bankruptcy, this is the first self-portrait he does after his bankruptcy. And it shows a Rembrandt that is absolutely decided to survive. He's the survivor. He shows himself as a king on the throne. He's got that, that baton in the hand. Uh, he's not broken. He uses extremely rich pigments there. And of course, ochres are not expensive. That's the advantage. He doesn't use uh, lapis lazuli, for example, at all. When he uses blue, it's azurite. But ochres is earth. And so it was enough for him to find the right earth and uh, he had these superb uh, colors. It, just for those of you that paint or appreciate the brushwork, you see here you can see better the, the touches, how the highlights he brings up on, on the, the scarf. And otherwise, very quick brushwork to make the pleats. Just a little touch, look at a little bit of highlight at the bottom, the ear, just a little bit, a little touch of red on the cheek. And the eye is so expressive and you just see the tiny bit of white that is well positioned. Den denial of Peter where he's asked when Jesus is arrested, ask if he knows Jesus. And of course, he's going to deny three times. Beautiful light that emerges from the servant's hand. It has a candle. 
he still he has his faithful and the trip family is one of them this is a painting where he was maybe still alive but he, it's the year he died and so we're not sure if it was uh the before his death or later but this is a family that still liked the way Rembrandt was painting. And they were, of course, very uh, wealthy, but also very connoisseur. The wife is actually dressed with the old fashion. As, uh, of that generation, many went on wearing the rough when the younger generation would had abandoned it for quite a while. Another group painting, the Sendic of the sampling officials of the Amsterdam Drapers Guild. They were in charge of sampling the fabric to make sure that it was the good quality because they were certifying it as being high quality. So they were in charge of sampling. So therefore very powerful. Now, this is uh, a little bit this is when finally the, the town hall is built in 1655. Uh, it is now the, the royal palace, but uh, was a very French architecture, uh, very classical architecture and uh, decorated interestingly enough, mostly the, the sculptural program inside uh, was by a, uh, and, uh, sculptor from Antwerp, Artus Quellinus, whose brother was a friend of Rubens and painted a lot with Rubens. And then what happens quite interestingly, it's the uh, Rembrandt gets a commission, but he only get the commission because Flink, his student had received the commission for 16 paintings to put within the um, the town hall and part, uh, one of them would be above the door but then on the sides across from the windows they were all decorated uh, too so he received these he starts doing the sketches to do and he died unexpectedly much too young and so they only have the possibility is redistribute all these commissions between the existing painters in, in uh, Amsterdam. And Rembrandt gets the most important, which is the beginning of the story of the Batavian. Batavian being the tribe, because at that time it was the tribe that had really started populating what is now the Netherlands. And they were the one that fought against the Romans. So they were considered very important. And it's a reflection on the Batavians fighting the Spaniards, though the Batavians are not there anymore, but it's almost a parallel between what happened against the Roman and then against the Spaniards. So they want the story of the Batavian. And Rembrandt comes up with this, which is only a part of the painting that he had done. You can see the uh, Clovis Civilis, uh, Claudius Civilis, sorry, uh, with the big crown in the middle. And it's the moment where they swear that they will fight until they die. And as you can see, they put all their swords together. Very powerful image, but again, we are with that new style of Rembrandt that is very fast, that leaves a lot to, to be completed, if you want, by your own imagination. And so he comes with the painting, which is, and I will show you more or less the size it had before. And a month after it hangs, they say, we don't want it. We want a more classical, more Italian-like type of painting. And so Rembrandt says he's going to change things. He takes it back home and never gives it back. And then after his death, it's going to be cut down and we don't know if he did cut it down or if it's people that um, after his death did it, but it looked that that was about what it was. So you, the scene that we saw was really cut here, but this was that big. And so it is, as you can see, you can see it is actually in a museum in Sweden and not in the Netherlands, which is quite interesting because it would have been considered something very national.
nationalistic. The Jewish Bride, it's a large painting. I don't know if you saw it or if you remember it, but it's a large painting. I know, remember standing in front of it at the Rakes and just couldn't leave it. It, was, <laughs> it is so attractive. I think it's amazing. And so there you can appreciate what we talk about, the quantity of pigment that he puts on, the, on his canvases is incredible. It's mind boggling. Now that painting has been also, as many paintings by Rembrandt, it's a big question. What, who does it represent? It's now taken the name of the Jewish bride, but this is no certainty at all. It could be Isaac and Rebecca. It could be Abraham and, and uh, Sarah. We're not sure. They, they, many names have been proposed. Uh, what is quite interesting, again, the, the costumes have nothing to do with contemporary costumes. These are theater costumes, very rich costume. When you look at her dress and his mantle and his sleeves, it's very, it, it's a, a very uh, costly costume. But it's the incredible tenderness that emanates from him. And his lovely hand that comes on her breast shows quite an affection and obviously uh, an intimacy. And she approves of it. it it's, you can see that she insists on, on the hand. It, it's absolutely extraordinary. He had done that before in another representation there where you see the two figures in that sketch with the hand, his hand on her breast. So that's why they believe that it's, that it could be uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Look at the work, the brushwork. And this is where you can see that the pearl, they almost have the, the relief of a real pearl. It puts so much pigment there. His sleeve also, it's, and when you're in front of it, what happens with that um, impasto, it catches the light. So depending on how the light is set, you really have that it all that that relief catches uh, the light beautifully. This is the time where uh, Enrique is uh, dies and leave him with a little girl, Cornelia, and of course a big vacuum in the house. And this is his last large painting. It's very large. It's 103 by 81 inches. And it's probably one of the most dignified, the most pensive. I don't know. It's a painting you want to see. That's why you notice I didn't even put the title next to it. I want you to look at it and feel that incredible moment where the prodigal son comes back to his father. And you don't see the face of the son, you see his back, you see his worn shoes and dirty feet, his ragged clothes, and the goodness that comes out of the face of the father. It's probably one of the works of Rembrandt that is the most found in churches used by a lot of priests or ministers or whatever as an example of forgiveness. Look at his feet. This is what the father said, my boy, you're always with me and everything I have is yours, despite the fact 
he spent everything. He wasted all the money he had received. In his last self-portrait, which is here, he, he represents himself as the apostle Paul. He shows again that emotion of that writer who wants to hearten the recipient of his epistles, but he's himself imprisoned at the time and knows he's going to die. This is the painting we had at the Phoenix Art Museum when we had a certain exhibition it was in Phoenix. Again, look at the brushwork. That face, he's in his 60s, but he looks like a much older man. And this is his last self-portrait. He died on October 4, 1669. His son had just died. He is the godfather of his granddaughter, Ticia, who was baptized that same year. And as I say, he was buried in a common grave, so we don't even know where his remains are. Such a genius. And this is just a view of some of the self-portrait he did, and you can see that progression in his life. And I want to leave you with that image. Thank you very much. And so next time we'll see Rembrandt's brush, which is gonna be a much more technical approach to, to him and works of his time. Uh, but we're going to look also at the, the process of inf infrared reflectography, different ways that you can analyze a painting to see uh, if it has been overpainted, uh, if it's a, a, a real Rembrandt or if it's a fake. And we'll, we'll look at different aspects of it, also different supports and so on. So thank you so much for being there. I hope you've enjoyed Rembrandt. And let me finish the recording.